Okay, so now we're looking into part two of our section 2.3 notes, which is on the limit properties. Uh, one thing that I want to do before I move on with the next section of the notes is kind of talk a little bit in more detail about polynomial and rational functions. Uh, because with polynomial, the idea is, is that polynomial functions are nothing more than the sum or difference of the power functions. And we already have the property that the limit as x approaches c of any power function is simply a direct substitution. And then we also have the properties, I'll write them both here. You have the first property, the limit, as x approaches c of x to the n. And again, this is where n is a positive integer. That this is nothing more than, hey, you just substituted in c to the n. And then you have that second limit property, which is the limit as x approaches c of any two functions that are added or subtracted to each other, that the limit of a sum or difference is the same as the limit of the first, add or subtract, to the limit of the second. And the idea is, is that since polynomials are nothing more than combinations of power functions with possibly a scalar multiple, so we'll add that one in, the limit as x approaches c of a constant times f of x is nothing more than the constant times the limit as x approaches c of f of x. That the combination of these three properties really basically tells you that polynomial functions are going to be continuous because they are the sum of continuous functions with a scalar multiple in front. So the idea is, is that if you ever want to take the limit of any polynomial function, so if, we'll call it p of x, is any polynomial function, and we wish to find the limit, so we want to do the limit as x approaches c of this polynomial function, it's basically a shortcut because it's nothing more than constants well, first off, it's nothing more than the sum or difference of power functions, so you can split them all up. And since they're power functions with a constant in front, you can pull the constant out. And then because it's a power function, you can plug in the value and calculate it. You can simply just calculate this directly by doing P of C. So that's the easiest way that you're taking a look at this is that, hey, no big deal. Polynomial functions are continuous. We can use direct substitution on them. Uh, the second type of function special function we want to talk about now that we've done our properties. We have our rational functions. And remind yourself, rational functions are typically, we'll call them, say, r of x, is the division of two polynomial functions. I'll use p of x and q of x. Only with the caveat, of course, q of x cannot equal 0. Okay, can't cause you to have division by 0 problems. Now, since this is a quotient, we're going to basically be using the property now that the limit, jot that down here, the limit as x approaches c of a division or a quotient, p of x over q of x, is nothing more than the limit as x approaches c of p of x, the top, divided by the limit as x approaches c of q of x, provided the limit as x approaches c of q of x does not equal 0. So a rational function, as long as you don't have division by 0 for the bottom limit, it's really continuous everywhere else. Rational functions only have discontinuities where you have division by 0 or domain restrictions. Now you have two types of discontinuities. They can either be a point discontinuity or an infinite discontinuity, but those are the only places where you would have any problems and have that division by 0. So as long as c is not a domain restriction for the rational function, then you can pretty much calculate the limit by doing direct substitution. So we'll say if, and I use r of x for this, so if r of x is a rational function, and just to give our definition, we're going to say where r of x is, p of x over q of x. 
of course with the caveat q of x cannot equal 0. And if c is a real number such that q of c does not equal 0, which is basically just saying, hey, it's not one of the domain restrictions. It doesn't cause a division by 0 problem. What we pretty much know is that this rational function is continuous at the other values of c, as long as it doesn't cause division by 0. So if we want to calculate the limit as x approaches c of this rational function r of x, because it's not a discontinuity, we can basically just plug it in. It's going to equal r of c, also known as p of c over q of c. Mm -hmm. So all we have to do is plug it in, and direct substitution applies. So I just thought I would give you those two things to kind of point out, to kind of wrap up two special functions from your Algebra 2 and your pre-calculus, which is your polynomials and rational functions, because we'll see quite a few of those in our calculus kind of um, experiences. Okay, continuing with functions that you learned in your pre-calculus, um, let's start with our trig functions. Now with our trig functions, the sine and the cosine are very straightforward, because if you will recall, your sine and your cosine waves are continuous functions. They're defined everywhere, smooth, continuous curves. So if I wanted to do the limit, as x approaches any real number for sine of x, because it is continuous, I can just simply do direct substitution and plug in sine of c. Likewise, if I want to do the limit as x approaches c for the cosine function, because it's continuous, I can use direct substitution and plug that directly in. Now, of course, where the problem comes is when you start getting into your other four trig functions because they have discontinuities. You have your tangent function, which has asymptotes at pi over 2 plus pi k at every pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, and so on. And then you have so you had vertical asymptotes in that location. You have your um, cotangent function, which has asymptotes at 0 plus pi k. And then your cosecant and your secant functions, your cosecant, because it's dividing by sine, um, has its asymptotes at 0 plus pi k, and your secant, which has asymptotes at pi over 2 plus pi k. And they're vertical asymptotes. Now, if we disregard the locations of the vertical asymptotes, the sections of the graph that fall in between, all of those points are actually continuous. So this is very similar to what we did for the rational functions. Up here, we said that, hey, as long as c is not where the discontinuity is, it's continuous at the rest of the stuff, and we can just plug it in. The same thing is going to apply for your trig functions that have discontinuities. So as long as c is in the domain of the trig function, you can use direct substitution. So as long as it's a tangent or a secant, and it's not equal to pi over 2 plus pi k, you can simply just plug it in and calculate your limit. Uh, so we'll go ahead, we'll just write them down just to be thorough in our notes. The limit as x approaches c of tangent of x is going to be tangent of c as long as c is not pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, negative pi over 2, and so on. Likewise, the limit as x approaches c for the secant of x, which has the same domain restriction because tangent is sine over cosine, secant is 1 over cosine, as long as you're not pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, you can simply plug it in. And then we'll finish our other two trig functions. If you take the limit of the cotangent of x, which is dividing sine, uh, cosine over sine, sine is 0 at 0 and pi and 2 pi and so on, some multiple of pi. As long as c is not one of those values, then you can just plug it in, find the cotangent of c, and then our last one, let's see if I can just squeeze it in here. The limit as x approaches c of the cosecant of x is, I'll curve it up here, cosecant of c. So the moral is, as long as it's not the domain restriction, then you simply plug it in. Now, if it's the domain restriction in, in all of these, the limit, of course, would not exist because you have an infinite discontinuity there and it's going to plus or minus infinity on the left and on the right, and that's one of the things that we said was a reason for the limit to not exist. 
Um, however, it does exist for all values, all real numbers up here for sine and cosine because they're continuous everywhere. Okay, so now we're going to come down here and we're going to take a look at uh, some more fancy things that have to do with trig. Uh, so now we've got the basic ones down. Uh, there's kind of a couple of things that we're going to have to do. We're either going to have to get used to using our calculator because it starts to get very difficult very quickly with the trig functions. Or we just have to basically memorize a couple of trig limits that are very special. Okay, so first thing we're going to do, since we've already done the calculator and we've worked with finding limits, um, numerically by looking at the table and looking at the graph. What I want you to do right now is, using your calculator, I want you to graph sine of x over x, look at the graph, determine what you think is happening with the limit as x approaches zero, then look at your table, test it out, see what you think, and come up with what you believe the limit is based on the numeric representation and the graphical representation. And then come over here and do the same thing for 1 minus cosine of x over x and then we'll come back together and we'll talk. So I'll pause it and give you a moment to work on those two problems using your calculator and then we will discuss. Okay, now let's talk about some extensions of these limits that you just found, all right? So let's process kind of what you found on your calculator. So if you come back and take a look at it, here's a picture of what your graph, sine of x over x, looks like. It comes across, it has a hole there. If I hit trace, I get undefined. But if I take a look at my table, I went ahead and did two for you, one where I went by 0.1, so you could examine what was happening. And then you can see here when I zoomed in, so my delta table was 0.001, that I'm getting very, very close to 1. So it's pretty obvious, hopefully, that when you look at your calculator, the limit of, as x approaches 0, of sine of x over x is 0, or is 1, I'm sorry. Now when we look over here at the 1 minus cosine of x over x, and that one, here's your picture that you're looking at. Again, if I were to hit trace, it has a discontinuity at x equal to 0, and it is a point discontinuity. When we take a look at the table, and I just did the uh, 0 0.001 as my delta x when I did set up my table, and take a look at it, and you can see your numbers are getting smaller and smaller and smaller with your scientific notation here, and you can see that they're approaching 0. You could zoom in a couple of times, but hopefully you found those pretty straightforward. Now, what this does is you are essentially going to need to memorize this. You just need to put it in your tool pack of things that you need to kind of just know, because you're going to be able to have to use these, and you'll see in the next page what I'm talking about. But these are two of what we call the special limits that you might as well just memorize. Uh, we'll show you a couple of different ways of actually proving them. But for most of what you're going to do, you're going to see them in a multiple choice question. And in the multiple choice question, you just have to remember that the sine of x over x, as x goes to 0, its limit is going to be 1. Okay? And be careful, though, because we'll see somewhere if the limit is as x goes to pi, you don't even have to worry about it because it would be defined everywhere except 0, goes back into the rational function as long as it's not the discontinuity, then you can just do direct substitution. So if this had been pi, you would have simply just substituted sine of pi over pi and calculate what it is. But for the special case, where the discontinuity occurs, where the point discontinuity occurs, you would just memorize these two values. Now, where are we going to use these? Let's take a look at the next section. Now, notice there's a couple of things here. What they have said that in general, they have a conditional statement here. So the first thing is let's look at if the g of 0 equals 0, okay, if I were to plug the value in and get 0, so in other words, saying, hey, that's where the discontinuity is. And if wherever you're approaching causes the denominator to go to 0, there's going to be a point discontinuity anytime you have this form or this form for your function. And you don't even have to worry about calculating, splitting it up, doing the composition that we did with the property on the earlier notes. All you have to remember is that the limit of this form is 1 and the limit of this form is 0. And it does have to do with how the behavior of the graph when you have x equal to 0, if you have a horizontal dilation or something where you're stretching or shrinking in, in some sort, it doesn't really change what's happening at 0 itself. It's only changing what's happening other places. So you pretty much just have this idea that, hey, easy peasy, remember which one it is. So the first one that you're looking at, like right here, 
when you are looking at this, when I plug in zero into this denominator, this is kind of like your g of x right here. If I calculate g of zero, it would be five times zero, which is zero. So I meet the requirement that I am of the correct form. Here's my g of x, sine of g of x over g of x. And the x is approaching zero causes g of x to go to zero, g of zero equals zero. So I don't even have to do any work for this. I pretty much go, hey, what's the limit? The limit as x approaches zero of sine of 5x over 5x is one, and you're done with the problem. Same thing is true over here. You have the same idea where you say, hey, it's in the correct form, one minus cosine g of x over g of x. And you're like, hey, that's pretty simple. It's in the right form. Hey, bet's going to be zero. Double check and make sure that when you do your g of zero, you get zero. And if that's true, then hey, no problem. This is of the correct form. You're going to know that this is going to be equal to zero. Now this one, a little bit different. Notice that instead of x going to zero, now x is going to seven. And the idea is, is that this is of the right form, sine of g of x and g of x. It actually doesn't even matter if x is going to zero. It, what matters is that g of that number, I guess here it probably would have been better just to do c. As long as g of that c is zero, then that's where the discontinuity is occurring, the point discontinuity. So another way of thinking about this is this, I think of this as the limit as x minus 7 goes to zero sine of x minus 7 over x minus 7, this is kind of this idea you're in the correct form. You're going to get, when you plug in your 7 here, your g of 7 is going to give us 0 on the denominator. And that's telling you that's where the point discontinuity is. And if you think about what's happened here, you've essentially just taken your graph, which is this, and you've done a shift to the right of 7. So I just basically took the same graph you saw in the earlier example and moved it over 7. Um, what if I was going to do, kind of sponging off of this example, what if I wanted to do the limit as x goes to 0 of sine of x minus 7 over x minus 7? Now be careful here, you'll get kind of super happy about seeing this form and not pay attention to the fact that this 0, when I plug it in, does not make the denominator 0 g of 0 is actually equal to negative 7. So that does not meet the criteria. This is not going to be equal to your 1, um, like this one was. So, like, so when I did this one, this one's going to be equal to 1 because it matched the form. Down here, that's not going to be equal to 1. This one goes back to the idea that, hey, as long as it's a rational function kind of idea, the only discontinuity that occurs here is that 7 the rest of the graph is continuous at all the rest of the values that are there. So all you have to do is direct substitution. You actually would simply do it's sine of negative 7 over negative 7. And then whatever that actually ends up being, uh, I think it was like 0.8 or negative 0.8. I can't remember, but you can type it in your calculator and see. So just be careful. You have to make sure that it matches the format that we're looking for and it has those two requirements. It has to have this part, sine of g of x over g of x, and whatever you're heading toward has to make the denominator zero. It has to be the point discontinuity. Now here's kind of an, an additional example that I want to do that you'll see when you're we're working on some of the things in class. What if I had, I'm going to spring off of this one over here. What if I wanted to find the limit as x approaches zero of sine of 5x divided by just x. Now the problem you have here is you're meeting the criteria that the denominator is going to be a discontinuity because you're going to have division by 0. But what the problem is is you don't have this in the correct form. You have sine of 5x but it's only over x and you really wanted to have sine of 5x over 5x in order to use this technique or use this memorization that you have. But that's really not going to bother me because what we're going to do, this is called a little trick. I want to have a 5 there and I don't. You can multiply by any form of 1 and it does not change an expression. So what I can do is I can essentially come in here and I'm going to multiply 
by 5 over 5, because that's a form of 1. And what that does is that allows me to think of this as the limit as x approaches 0. I'm going to leave the numerator 5 out there and then do sine of 5x. And I'm simply going to move this in with the denominator so I can get this correct form. And then we're going to say, hey, wait a minute. This is a constant times a function, so how do I calculate the limit when you have a scalar multiple? You pull the scalar multiple to the front. So this becomes 5 times the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of 5x over 5x. And by introducing this super special multiply by a form of 1 over here, then you go, hey, guess what? I have it now in the correct form. I can do this limit. This limit is going to be 5 times this limit, which we've memorized, is 1, which gives us 5. And so that'll kind of give you a heads up of some things that you're going to be looking at. All right, so now let's come down to these examples here on the bottom. So now we're going to start combining things together and using the limit properties as well as these limits that we have memorized to help us calculate these. Now what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to pause it and I'd like you to try the first three and kind of see where you're at and then we'll come back together and we'll discuss them. Okay, so let's come back together. Now you may have found these a little difficult. I kind of threw those at you mostly just to see a little bit of your algebra and your skills that you learned in pre-calculus and trig and see what you could remember from that. But let's take a look at this first one. Now the idea here is to recognize that you're trying to get something of the form of sine of x over x. And the fact that I have this extra plus x there, that doesn't bother me so much because I'm just going to remember that I can simply take any fraction that has a common denominator, and for lack of a better word, I'll call it uncommon denominator it. I'm going to split the fraction up to what it would have been before I combined it together in that common denominator. And the reason why I do that is because I'm trying to get this sine of x over x. Now, when I do that, then I simply go, well, wait a minute, that's really the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 plus sine of x over x, and the property says that when you add two functions, the limit of a sum is the sum of the limits. So all I have to do is come in here, take the limit as x goes to 0 of 1, plus the limit as x goes to 0 of sine of x over x, and then right there I'm ready to answer my question because the limit as x approaches 0 of a constant is constant, plus this special limit, which is 1, should memorize, which would give me my final answer of 2. So the idea is, is that, hey, you might need to do a little bit of algebra. That's why we have to review our algebra skills in order for us to kind of work with these. Now this second one, a little bit of a trick to this one, is was to use a trig identity. And there's some algebra involved. What I first remember or recall is that tangent is equivalent to sine of cosine or sine of x over cosine of x. So I'm going to make a substitution. So this is very similar to back in pre-calculus when you were doing your trig identities and your substitutions. I make that substitution. Okay, and, I, and I'm going to remember a little algebra. Dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. So this is the same as I'm basically going to flip the cosine up to the top. It's going to be x over sine of x times cosine x. Now, this is really close to the uh, property that I want to have, uh, except it's the reciprocal of it. So just to kind of get it in the right format, I'm going to rewrite this as 1 over okay, our sine of x over x. Because what I have here is the reciprocal of the form that I was looking for. And of course, times this cosine of x. Now it does not bother me that I have all of this going on now because this is the quotient and the product of functions. And according to our limit properties, I can take the limit of the top and the limit of the bottom as long as it's not zero, which it's not because that special limit is one, and multiply it times the limit of the cosine. And so we end up with the limit as x approaches zero of one divided by your limit as x approaches 0, sine of x over x, times the limit as x approaches 0, 
of cosine of x. Okay, and then you start getting upset because this cosine here bothers you, but remember, cosine is continuous, and you can always find the limit by using direct substitution. So over here, the limit of a constant is the constant. The limit of the special sine x over x as x goes to 0, 1. And the limit here, I'm going to use my direct substitution, that's cosine of 0. And if you remember your trig, unit circle, cosine of 0 is 1. So 1 times 1 gives us a final answer of 1. Okay. Now let's take a look at this part C over here. We'll do the same kind of idea. I'll change color just so it would be a little different. I'm going to use a trig identity. Since what I know I have a form for is this cosine, 1 minus cosine of x over x kind of idea. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, well, what do we call secant? Trig identity is 1 over cosine. So I'm going to rewrite this limit. Theta goes to 0. 1 over cosine theta minus 1 theta times 1 over cosine theta. And I'm going to use a little algebra trick. I could get common denominators and do all that stuff, but that's really going to take a long time. I'm going to remind myself that, hey, I can multiply by a form of 1 and get this into a nicer form. I'm going to multiply by cosine theta over cosine theta. We'll remember to distribute here and here. And this is legal because I'm basically multiplying by 1. When I distribute that through, what I end up with is the limit as theta approaches 0 of 1 over cosine theta times cosine, 1. 1 times cosine theta. So I get 1 minus cosine theta in the top. And on the bottom, this cosine theta times 1 over cosine theta, they're going to cancel, and I'm just left with theta, which is exactly the special limit that I had, so it's going to 0. So that kind of shows you a little bit of where our algebra skills, our skills using trig and trig identities are going to come in for us to do much more complicated limits algebraically that we're looking at. Okay, I'm going to pause it again. Let me give you a chance to work the three down here at the bottom and see what you can do with those, and then we'll come back together. Um, actually, please make sure that you are trying them, because I know these are notes and we're kind of working our way through it, but I, I would like you to make sure that you take a moment and try to work the problem yourself, then come get a hint. You can even pause mine in the middle of it. Like if you want to watch the first couple steps that I'm doing on mine and then see if you can finish it, then that would kind of give each of you kind of a individualized help to where you need it and then you can continue the problem. So, but take a moment first and try to look at this before I work it. All right, let's take a look at our nice complicated one that we have here. And, and I'm gonna do the same kind of thing. I'm looking for certain forms that are there. Now, what you notice is it might bother you because you have this sine and a cosine in the 5x and the 2x. But what you have to remember is that you can split this all up because this is all multiplication and division. I can rewrite this as a limit as x goes to 0. I'm going to take the 4 and the cosine of 2x and group those together. And then I'm going to take the sine of 5x and put that with the x. The thing that's causing the division by 0 is the x. This cosine of 2x and this 4, kind of regrouping it in this fashion, I can take the limit as x approaches 0 of this part because that's not the discontinuity. The cosine of 0 is 1, so this ends up actually just being a direct substitution. This is where you have the discontinuity coming into play, but now I've got it to the point where I can split it and turn it into the special form. So we have the limit as x approaches 0 of 4 over cosine of 2x times the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of 5x over x. And again, we're going to employ that trick, and I'm going to start kind of cheating just a little bit, where you multiply by that form of 1. So technically I can do 5 over 5, put the 1 5 on the bottom, pull the scalar multiple out, and then calculate the limit. But I'm just going to do it all in one step and do I can put a 5 out here and a 5 in here and recognize that I'm multiplying by that form of 1. Okay, I kind of did it the long way when I did it earlier. Um, here, I'm going to go ahead and just stick a constant on the outside, stick the division on the inside so they cancel each other out. And then I'm going to go ahead and calculate the limits. This would be my direct substitution. 
4 times the cosine of 2 times 0 or 0 times 5 from here times the special limit, which we know is 1, which is going to give us 4 over 1 times 5 times 1, which is 20. And we're done with that problem. All right, so again, the idea is, is that you're trying to examine it to help try to locate, isolate the special form that is going to be the limit that you've memorized and then be able to use it. All right, same kind of idea over here. Now, looking at this, you know, and if you're not convinced the limit exists, I would say pick your calculator up, graph this, take a look at what's happening around zero, and you'll see that it does have a limit. So what we're going to do is I'm going to use the trig identity. I'm going to first change this to sine over cosine. So I have the limit as x approaches 0. I have sine of 3x, cosine of 3x, divided by sine of 4x. Now what I'm going to do, because the special form is sine of a function over the function, sine of g of x over x. These two signs I'm going to kind of leave together for the moment. I'm going to pull this cosine out. I'm going to rewrite this as the limit as x goes to 0 of 1 over cosine of 3x. I'm basically pulling that out of the numerator times sine of 3x over sine of 4x. So I want you to take a moment and just kind of verify that you like my manipulation of that fraction. And again, part of the reason why I'm doing that is because this limit, now that I have the limit of a product, is the product of the limits, this limit is easy because it's a direct substitution problem, because this is not a discontinuity. It is a discontinuity over here because sine of 0 is 0. And you're like, well, what am I going to do? It doesn't have the sine of 3x over x or the sine of 4x over x. But guess what? Remember, you can always multiply by a form of 1. This is going to be a trick that you're going to see us using over and over again in calculus. And that trick is if you need something there and you can get it there by multiplying by a form of 1, we're going to do that. So I'm going to multiply by 1 over x over 1 over x, which is essentially 1. And again, it doesn't bother me that this has got a division by 0 because I'm not plugging 0 in. I'm approaching 0 because I'm doing a limit. So that's perfectly legal. So we're going to end up with, and I'll just go ahead and keep writing things down until I actually take the limit at the end. So we have as x goes to 0, this 1 over cosine of 3x. And then this now becomes sine of 3x over x. I'm going to multiply this times the top. And then on the bottom, I'm going to have sine of 4x over x. And what I have managed to do here is end up in the correct form here and here, and I have products and quotients. And so I can split this. The limit of a product is the product of the limits. The limit of a quotient is the quotient of the limits as long as the denominator limit is not 0. So we go ahead and we split. I'm going to do the limit as x goes to 0 of 1 over cosine of 3x times the limit as x goes to 0 of sine of 3x over x, and then divided by the limit as x goes to 0 of sine of 4x over x. And now at this point you might be saying, hey, wait a minute, you're missing something. You're missing your 3 here. I'm like, that. Eh, no problem. It's easy. Put a 3 and a 3. Here I'm missing a 4, so I would do 4 and a 4. And now I have it in my form that I can take the limit. And of course, we know that limit's not going to be equal to zero, so we're okay in splitting up that quotient. So here, direct substitution, you would end up with 1 over cosine of zero by plugging that in, which is going to actually go ahead and figure it out below 1. Here you're going to have times the 3, and then this limit is going to be 1, divided by this 4 times this limit, which again is 1, so I get 1 times 3 fourths, or three-fourths. And I'll let you verify that with the calculator, but that would be the limit for part E. All right, let's take a pause, let you take a moment, absorb that, come back, revisit this now that we've done a little bit of discussion, and we will come back together and we'll... All right, so we take a look at this one, and as you see, they're kind of increasing in difficulty as we are working through these. And again, the idea is I'm just showing you examples 
of some things that you may see and some tricks that you're going to be seeing. All right, now with this one, your first temptation is going to probably be to try to turn this into the 1 minus cosine x over x um, format that we have up here. Slide back up here to the top. Try to get it in this form. So initially, when you start trying to do that, you're like, okay, let's do the limit as x approaches 0. I need this to be 1 minus cosine, not cosine minus 1. We can achieve that very simply by factoring out a negative 1, which would make it negative plus here, or you can just switch it around and do 1 minus cosine of x. So I can pull that out. And then looking at it, you can go, all right, well, then I can do 3x times x. And initially, when I did this problem myself, I was grouping this together. And then that would give me kind of the reciprocal of what I was looking for. But the problem with that is I'm still getting a 0 over 0, a discontinuity. I can't remove it. It doesn't help me because the limit on the bottom is undefined. I'll go ahead and write it, and then I'm just going to erase it just to kind of show you what I mean by that. So this can be rewritten as I'm going to absorb the negative up here with this negative 3x and do divided by 1 minus cosine of x over x. And you're like, hey, I'm going to do the limit of the quotient. But the problem is you can't do the limit of the quotient because the bottom limit happens to be zero. So I can't use that rule. So I come back to the drawing board. I'm going to erase this and say, now what do I do? And I go, wait a minute. Maybe if I could turn it into the sine one, then maybe it wouldn't be as difficult. And this is a trick that you did back in your trig identities, which is multiplying by a conjugate to try to get a Pythagorean identity. So I'm going to take this. I'm actually going to multiply both the top and the bottom by 1 plus cosine of x, and then 1 plus cosine of x. Because what that does is this part right here, when you multiply it out, is going to become 1 minus cosine squared x, which if you will remember is your Pythagorean identity and that's sine squared x. So that's going to get me to the limit as x approaches 0. I'm going to absorb the negative up here, negative 3, x times x times 1 plus cosine x divided by this 1 minus cosine squared, which is going to become sine squared x. Now, the reason why I did that is because now I can go the limit as x approaches 0. I'm going to split sine squared of x is really nothing more than sine of x times sine of x. So I'm going to rewrite this as negative 3 from here times x over one of the sine of x's times x over the other sine of x times 1 plus cosine of x. And what that allows is now I can do the limit of the product. And let's see, I think I can know why I went over here to the side when I was doing this previous example. Let's see if I can move these pieces. No, it's not letting me do it. I'm going to piggyback and come down here to finish this problem. All right. So now I've got the limit of several products. I'm going to go ahead and do the product of the limits. And we'll just for the interest of time, just do this. I'm not going to write it down. I'm just going to say it, and I'm going to write it down. I have the limit as x goes to 0 of negative 3, which is the limit of a constant, which is the constant. Then I have the limit of x over sine of x, which is the special one, which is 1. The limit of the next x over sine of x, which is 1. And then I have the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 plus cosine of x. And again, this doesn't bother me because there's not a discontinuity. I can do direct substitution. Negative 3 times this plugging in 1 plus cosine of 0. And cosine of 0, of course, is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 times negative 3 gives me negative 6. All right, so this gives you kind of a good example of several types of problems that you'll see, as well as some examples of the types of algebra and trig substitutions and identities that you're going to have to be familiar with from your previous pre-calculus classes.